Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast by Triad Behavioral Health, where we cover trending topics in behavioral and mental health. This podcast is designed to share unique and relevant topics occurring within the world, our communities, and bring them a mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor, and joining me today is Dr. Kevin Bowman. Kevin received his doctoral degree in clinical psychology from Kent State University in Ohio. Kevin's professional experience includes work as a staff psychologist, and he was a training director at the University of Pittsburgh's Counseling Center in Pennsylvania. He's also been the Associate Vice President for Students and Director of the Counseling and Behavioral Health Services at San Francisco State University in California. Currently, Kevin is the Director of Counseling and Behavioral Health Services at Hawaii Pacific University in Honolulu, Hawaii. He also has a private practice. Hey, Kevin, welcome to Behavioral Health Today, and thank you for being here with us. It's nice to be here, Graham. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Hey, you know, today we're talking about mental health services being provided by colleges and universities and their counseling centers and the services that students can access. We know kind of setting a little bit of a backdrop that entering college is a, a really exciting time. It's a special time in a young person's life. And there are a number of areas that can raise awareness that we get a chance to do today. We want to raise some awareness around their mental health at this time and what some of the services are that they can access and they can be assisted by during their college years. We know that most young people are entering college around 17, 18 years old, and this is a really interesting developmental stage with a number of developmental tasks that occur during their college experience. So what I'd like to start out with is if you could kind of give us a backdrop and describe for us what is going on during this developmental stage and the inherent tasks and some of the issues that you see arise as they enter college, including maybe sometimes being away from home for the very first time. What do you see? I've had the uh, opportunity since I've been in the field uh, for quite a while. I think 10 years at Pitt started off my career right out of graduate school, and then another 15 years at San Francisco State, both in the uh, counseling center, now at HPU's counseling center. So I've seen a wide range of different types of presentations students have had when they've come to campus. I think when I first started my career, it was pretty typical that students would sort of find their way into the counseling center, maybe their junior year, maybe their senior year. And those kinds of problems tend to be relatively minor, relatively benign. You would see relationship kinds of issues that would come up. That would be probably the number one kind of problem you would see sometimes difficulty with academic struggles, maybe roommate kinds of issues. Every once in a while, I would get a graduate student come in who would want to discuss existential kinds of (laughs) issues. They would stay with me for the entire four years of their uh, college career. But very rarely would you see students, and you know, I'm talking 15, 20 years ago, who would come in with pretty severe kinds of mental health presentations, depression. Every once in a while, you would see a student would come in who would talk about suicidal ideation and maybe mm-hmm. some other kinds of cognitive uh, disorders, but but few and far between. So fast forward to you know the last 10 years, maybe 12, 15 years, the kinds of presentations we see now on college campuses are much more severe. We see students who come in with suicidal ideation. We see students come in with cognitive dis- disorders. We uh, see students who come in with bipolar kinds of struggles. Suicidal ideation is not uncommon at all. Cutting and other kinds of mental health struggles. I I would say probably the most interesting phenomenon that I have seen over the years is, again, starting off my career at Pitt, students would come in around their junior year. Now we're getting calls. I think college counseling centers are getting calls from students and parents, even before they enter college, uh, indicating that perhaps they're in treatment, they're on medication, parents want to make sure there's some sort of continuity of care to make sure that once they leave home and start their first year of college, that they have a psychologist, mental health practitioner, uh, psychiatrist there to continue their treatment. I think universities are understanding the need now Mm. for it. Uh, I think as college counseling center directors and staff become better at articulating the need, universities are responding. It's not just about counseling. It's about sometimes retention efforts, making sure that 
students are healthy enough to stay in school, uh, to attend class, to graduate. So it has changed tremendously yep. over the last mm -hmm. 15 or 20 years. The need and the request for counseling have, have increased. There's been some data that suggests that one in four incoming freshmen are suffering from some form of clinical depression. There's been a 25% increase in students who are requiring medication. There's more increase in terms of students who have been hospitalized over the last 15, 20 years. So it has changed, the needs have changed on college campuses. Sounds like a pretty critical service to have in place. You know, these are the, these are the students coming in, they've got some potential to do well, but these are some of the things that have to be considered and planned for. On top of those, you're talking uh, about this is a group of students kind of in an age group where developmentally they're leaving home for the very first time. Let's assume people are going away to school. Uh, it's a little different right now with school being done online, but for the most part, the traditional school, people going away to school for the very first time, away from home for the very first time. It's a, a time when they begin to individualize and differentiate from their families and having roommates, fraternities, sororities. But there's freedom uh, and there's a lack of supervision that's very, very different for them and a lot of them for the very first time getting to experience some of these things. And also some of them are in an age range now where they can start to use some substances and they are confronted with and are in an environment with where it is very different than with mom and dad, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, a lot of students just can't wait to leave home. Yeah. They can't wait to get away and to become their own person, to experience their own identity. And oftentimes, and I think this is pretty common in terms of human nature, we often think that if we go someplace different, go someplace new, right. go someplace exciting, that all the sort of trials and tribulations and struggles right. and mental health kinds of issues we have will just somehow magically disappear. Having worked in San Francisco and having worked in Hawaii, I see that sometimes happen where people will come here who may be handling and struggling with different issues, say back, uh, say in my hometown, Ohio, and somehow feel that by coming to California, coming to right. uh, a nice place like this, sure. that those worries somehow uh, disappear. And that's just not the case. So a lot of students come with that sort of belief and then they get to college and college adds additional stress. So now mm -hmm. you have the additional stress of roommates, the additional stress of a curriculum that's much more severe where instructors expectation in terms of how they perform in the classroom mm -hmm. is higher. Everything is more, is more intense. So mm -hmm. not only are they now struggling with the same kinds of issues they were struggling with back home, they also have the additional kinds of struggles as well. And it catches a lot of students off guard. I'd imagine. Uh, there's that old saying, wherever you go, there you are. Right. And those right. feelings are there. So we try really early on with our orientation periods with freshmen and students to make them aware of those kinds of things. And don't be surprised if you were feeling depressed, if you were feeling anxious, if you were feeling sort of socially disconnected, that by coming to college, those feelings don't always go away. And sometimes it can be exacerbated by the additional stress. And we're here to help and we're here to support you during those times. So even at the front end as they're coming in, you're beginning to name and actually normalize that these are some naturally occurring things. Let's be aware of them. Let's name them. If we need to, you know, identify them early, we can treat them early if necessary. But really normalizing for them, this is part of the developmental stage as part of this next season of your life that you're coming into and that's one of the services what kind of professionals tend to work in a college counseling or university counseling center what kind of professionals do you guys have there's a range we have master's level social workers we have marriage family therapists who work in counseling centers who are quite effective we certainly have psychologists phds and psyds who work and university counseling centers who are quite effective. I think some of the larger universities may even have psychiatrists on staff, mm -hmm. which more and more are needed in working with our students. So there's really quite a range. Some of the universities, uh, actually including ours, uh, we have spiritual counselors on campus because we've realized that uh, many of our students are spiritually grounded. They may feel actually more comfortable speaking to someone yeah like that sure. than perhaps sure. a uh, therapist or psychologist. Yeah. Uh, and we work very closely with our university chaplain. And if the university chaplain feels like they're 
needs that maybe go beyond their level of expertise and training, then they'll facilitate referrals to the counseling center. So we try to do everything really as good. much as we can to, to reach out. Uh, the other thing that I think is important to mention is that universities usually work with staff and faculty to train them yes. to help identify students in the classroom who are having difficulty. So that old saying that it takes the village is really yes. true, I think, with university. So oftentimes we'll have faculty and staff who are concerned about students mm -hmm. who have been trained by our staff to identify certain mental health kinds of situations. Maybe a student who doesn't come to class or a student who seems disheveled or someone who um, may be disruptive will actually call us and ask us to connect or reach out or make a referral to the counseling center. So absolutely, Graham, we try on the front end to work with students to help them become aware of different things that might come up. And we also train university personnel, faculty and staff to work with us so we can get students the help and care that they need. That's really good. Kevin, we're in a really unique time right now worldwide, but in the United States dealing with COVID and it's really changed and altered so many areas of our lives, including the ways that we learn. The majority of universities and colleges that I know about right now are going to more online kind of virtual learning, distance learning. But I do know that those that are still coming into this developmental age, going into college, still are going to be needing some services. And they might have their own folks already in line, their practitioner, or somebody they're already seeing. But what kind of services are you folks, even at HPU, doing in terms of uh, a response to COVID and the availability you folks have for students that they can access you and uh, maybe benefit as necessary. What are you guys doing? We've learned, I think from last year, that the effects of COVID on college students is pretty significant. And yes. students who were not struggling with typical signs of mental health issues during the COVID situation, began to develop them in terms of anxiety and some depression and feeling isolated. Those with already pre-existing conditions we found became worse during this time. So we, we learned, I think, a, a valuable lesson that we've tried to carry over to this year. This, this whole COVID things it seems to be like a moving target. We don't know where it's gonna be. And most of our orientations and many of our orientations this year we talk to students about the possibility of what it might be like if, in fact, things get worse and there is a shelter in place. What we have found is that giving students a heads up can be very important. So in a way, it sort of normalizes what they might expect and what they're going through. What we found last year when the COVID epidemic struck and there was a shelter in place and we went online is that students felt isolated. And I think this was yes. the general feeling across the nation of college students. Yes. You felt isolated. There was a lack of structure. You can imagine if you get up in the mornings with your roommates and go to class, go to lunch, go to you know, breakfast, go to you yeah. know, work out, there's a structure in place. Uh, yeah. But when you're home online, you tend to lose that structure and you tend to lose mm -hmm. your way a little bit. You tend to, to feel a little bit disconnected. Interesting enough, social media, I think, was both positive and negative for some students, positive in the sense that it kept them connected to friends, relatives, and significant others, sometimes negative because some of the postings on social media were extremely positive and people talked about the, the wonderful things they were doing in their life. And people would look at those and think, well, you know, that's not happening in my life and maybe there's something that's not going as well as I would like for it to go. And we began to feel depressed. So giving students a heads up in terms of what they might experience during that time, I think is I like important. That. Normalizing the experience is important. Knowing that there's help and support, checking in on them, having them connect with us, helping them to stay on track, to stay on schedule, I think is important. And providing them with opportunities to, as much as possible, have a daily normal routine yes. uh, in their life. One of the other concerns I think instructors experience, and I think this was on all levels, not just collegiate, but high school and, and elementary school, is that sometimes students disappeared when they were online. 
And that was for a variety of reasons. They just didn't show up or they just didn't log in. And a lot of the students were having difficulty with being at home and being sheltered in place, feeling isolated and disconnected. So it, it means that as universities, we have to make a special effort to reach out to students during this time to keep them involved, keep them invested, keep them focused, sort of keep them on the path of continuing their education. Really good. You know, I, I know that we are wired to respond best to when things are structured and we can anticipate there's organization in our lives, you know, provides a sense of safety and containment, all those good things. And I, I would agree that the degree of isolation kind of being mandated right now through the quarantines and work from homes, et cetera, you know, learning, you know, in a, in a distant way, really take away some very, very important things for students to have outside of their homes, a different kind of structure, also the social piece. And that degree of isolation, I think we all knew that relationships were important, but not until this quarantine, I think, are we really fully appreciating just how important people are in our lives. I even had somebody say when this first came out, she, she was saying, I'm, a, I'm kind of an introvert. So I've been training all my life for COVID in terms of the isolation and being, you know, in quarantine, et cetera. But after a couple of months, she's saying, you know what, even as an introvert, I've enough. I'm, I've had enough. Exactly I've had right. enough. I'm done. Yeah. I'm ready to start, you know, starting right. to meet people. She might even become a little more extroverted. Who knows? But that idea, like you're saying, the isolation is pretty significant, isn't it? It is. And, and it really pushes us as therapists to be creative yeah. and to make that special effort. Because when you think about it, uh, what the, COVID and the shelter in place is done to some degree is it has taken some of the resources that we would ordinarily recommend to people to deal with anxiety and to deal with depression. For example, you know, go to the gym, work out, go to the park, take a walk, go to a restaurant, meet some friends for coffee, yeah. go to the theater. All those things now are not available. And so it makes it very difficult sort of therapeutically to intervene when people are suffering and they're sheltered in place. Sometimes just having a weekly or a couple bi-weekly uh, or maybe two sessions a week with a, a student. A and the, the conversation isn't necessarily deeply clinical. It, it's know. just about connecting and talking about what's going on and helping them yep. keep on track and maybe asking them from time to time to uh, turn off so social media for a while yeah. or maybe not listen to the news every day because sometimes yeah. that can be depressing and add to their sense of despair. So it is important that we reach out both sort of proactively and during the process. We also work with instructors too in helping them to connect with, with students during this yeah, time. Good. And uh, a lot good. of professors are very good at reaching out to us and asking us to connect with students during this time. Really good. Really good. You guys are busy. I know we're kind of coming to a close. I want to ask, I know you're a father as well for your kids and their entry to college? What's a father's message that's a psychologist and been around colleges for a while? What, what's your message to your kids? If you can kind of give us kind of some of the, maybe a little pithy message of uh, what you want them to experience and enjoy and how to think about it. What do you, how would you tee that up for them? Any thoughts? Well, education has always been encouraged and seen as something that in my family is, is something that we work very hard towards. And I think it's also important that they be well-rounded too. So the expectations are there. I try to be a dad first and a psychologist second I because I, I get the, the jabs from my kids. So stop being a psychologist, be yes, a daddy, know. you know. So I, I, it's a balance there I try to reach with them. But they understand that the expectation on my part is that they work very hard in school and go as far as they can. You um, know, just uh, speaking to parents for a second around that, I really believe having expectations is a really helpful thing for our children to receive from us, you know, healthy expectations. And it helps convey and help them envision what they have the potential for and what they can reach as they realize their gifts and their talents and their abilities. So I love that idea of expectation being a part of the message. So I, th I think that's true with my kids. What I've had to learn is that they have to go their own path. That's right. Uh, uh, the things that were important or that I was interested in, some of those things they have an interest in, some of them they don't. But as long as what they do, they work hard at it and do their best, then you I'm bet. happy with them. Yeah. It gets to be their life, doesn't it? 
Yeah, it is their life. And they, and they get the blueprint with all the good ingredients that along the way, ideally, we as parents get to put in the mix. Yes. Well, Kevin, my friend, it's always great to be with you. And I, I certainly appreciate, you know, you being with us today and talking about your multiple years of experience within the college and university settings and the counseling centers and just the myriad services that these students get to benefit from, from you and your training of the staff and their professors and really being able to provide a nice place for them to, to land if necessary, to structure some things, ways to be successful. I really hope people, you know, they're going away to colleges and parents, uh, students alike, really remember that service is there for them to use and there can really be an additional benefit as they go through school, not just learning about subjects, but maybe an opportunity to learn about themselves as well. So I really appreciate you being with us today and sharing your experiences with us. It's been my pleasure, Graham. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you. And for those of you listening in, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tried Behavioral Health Network, all rights reserved.